and to bring them before thee as we do this afternoon. And so we thank thee for the company gathered. We thank thee for every head bowed in thy presence now. And as we are gathered together, we do pray that we might know a sense of thy presence. And that we might know a sense of thy blessing. And that thy blessing particularly will rest upon Paul and Rachel and the family this afternoon. And so we ask for thy blessing that upon those who will speak this afternoon, we do pray that thou wouldst take them up and use them, and that we might hear thy voice through them this afternoon. So we seek thy blessing upon us on our time together, for we ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. <coughs> now we're going to sing a second hymn. All the way my Savior needs me, what have I to ask? Beside. And again, after the introduction, we'll rise and sing the three verses of this hymn. Serve his Lord and our Lord 
what to open up the scriptures today to read concerning the two great traditions given in the scripture. First of all, in Matthew chapter 28, we read Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, reading at verse 16. <coughs> then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Turn now, please, further into Acts chapter 13, please, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and we'll read verse 1. Now there were in the church of the anti of certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrach, and Saul. And the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, and made their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. Go on now to chapter 14, please. Chapter 14 of the same book. Acts chapter 14. And now verse 25. And when they preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalera. And then sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which is fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the doors of faith unto the Gentiles and there they abode a long time with the disciples. We well, sure again, as always, God will bless the public reading of his word. We've read really concerning the two great commissions and the two great commendations given to believers and to the church. As you were prepared to come today, you were thinking you were coming. You get by God speak to Paul and Rachel and the two children into God's work. But you know, as we read in Matthew, the end of Matthew there, we discover this. There are 12 or 11 disciples before the Lord. And the Lord gives that commission. Not to one, not to two, not to three, not to four, not to a Simon, not to a Peter, not to a John. You know, he gives that commission to all of these 11. You know, dear believers, this afternoon, this commission is given to you, and this commission is given to myself. As I look down, I see various brethren and sisters who have been commended to the Lord in full-time service. And you'll agree with me, it seems to be something that is a to put on that statement. So-and-so is in full-time service. So-and-so has been in full-time service for so many, many years. You know, brothers and sisters, every one of us, after that day of salvation, we have been commissioned to go into the service of the Lord. Some of us are saved very, very young, age 10 as far as myself is concerned. I'm sure there are many in here today who are saved at a very young age. We know that commission has been given to each and to every one of us. Our brother Robert here will tell us later on that he's been in service, a full-time service, for 55 years. 
And no doubt Robert will also tell you before that he was still in the service of the Lord. Today, brothers and sisters, this is a call to each and every one of us, each and every one of us, to be in the service of the Lord. There is work for us all to do. Work for us all to do, whether young or old, whether male or female, there is work for us all to do. And this commission we read about at the end of the last Bible is given to you and it is given to me. Paul and Rachel have answered a question asked of them by the Lord. I wonder have I answered that question? I wonder, brother, have you answered the question? I wonder, sister, have you answered the question? The question is asked, who will go? You know, that question was asked in heaven. And in the eternity gone past, that question was asked, who will go? The answer came, here am I. Here am I. Send me. And while today we have great privilege, and while today we have great pleasure commending Paul, commending Rachel, and the two children to the Lord's work. Let us today, let us today just take that challenge to each and to every one of us. And let's all go from today willing and able. We've been discussing a wee bit in the Bible reading on Tuesday night in the hall here. That God calls, we know God also fits. And brothers and sisters, we will not be called to our work which God has not fitted you to do. Please, Pray to God. Please speak to your Saviour. Ask the question, Lord, what will thou have me to do? I do trust that we might just take that simple question today. Who will go and answer it? Here am I. Send me. You know, as we turn to Acts chapter 13, we discover now a specific call. A specific commission, a specific commendation. Now again we are at the assembly in Antioch. I don't know how large an assembly Antioch was. In that first verse there are a number of names mentioned in it. And that tells me simply there were a number of people in the assembly at Antioch. You know as these brethren prayed, as these brethren and sisters, as they watched, they were able to see one, ones who were able to go and serve the Lord in a specific <coughs> way. How are these brothers and sisters guided? Guided by their own thoughts? Guided by their own mind? Guided by their own eyes? Yes, that was part of it. But they were also guided by the Holy Spirit. Guided by the Holy Ghost himself. And brothers and sisters, that's the way that the people in the name of all, the first the name of all, has looked upon Paul and Rachel as they have come in among them. I'll say again, only a short time, nevertheless, a time where we've watched, a time where we've noted their willingness just to go and serve the Lord. Some of them have served with Paul and Rachel, who are glad to have done that. But now it's a case where they've got to go forth. They've got to go forward. They've got to go outside the company here. And again, as David says, we'll be great pleasure today just to commend them to the work of the Lord. It will not cease to not stop the work here in the home. Rather, it will build upon it. It will build upon it. Much prayer goes up for the work here in the home. Much more prayer there now will be added to that. And that work will include Paul. It will include Rachel. And dare I say it will also include the two children as well. You see, we might think, well, Paul is going into service. Paul is going into service. You know, Rachel sitting here, she is also going into service as well. The two children likewise, because the whole family are going to be involved in that. You know, when I came to Long Hall, way back in 1974, seemed like a long, long while. We already had at that time two full-time servants with Mr. Gooding and with Mr. Hunter. <coughs> We know before that, before that they had commended long, long time before that. And they had a family. Brian is sitting here today, Brian Goodwin is sitting here today. Harry Hunter is sitting here on the left hand side as well. They were children when their fathers were commended to the Lord. What happened? There was a Mrs. Gooding. 
and there's a message hunted at home watching. So what are you afraid for? And what are you thinking about, Paul? Please think about Rachel. Please think about these two children. Oh yes, we will try our best as far as you and Paul is concerned. We would love to do your fellowship as well. Pray for the wife that is left. Pray for the children that have been brought up in that circumstances. I know Paul will not forget about them. I know that. I know Paul too well for that. He will never forget. He's got a wife, he's got a family at home. But likewise, brothers and sisters, let us not forget either. Let us, as we commit Paul to the work, let us also remember Rachel, and let us also remember the two children. So that's my friend, that's brothers and sisters, that's the two great commissions that to be found in the scriptures. First of all, a commission and a call given to each and to every one of us. But secondly, that great commission and that great commendation given to individuals taken from the company to go out and to serve and to preach and to teach. We know also the read in Acts chapter 14 tells me this, that association goes on. Our association doesn't start with Paul and Rachel today as far as this commendation is concerned. It goes on and it goes on. From chapter 13 in the book of Acts into chapter 14, Paul is doing his first missionary journey. He goes for many, many thousands of miles. Maybe we should say thousands of kilometres, looking at the young folk in here. I don't know how many miles, how many kilometres Robert has done. He's about again to go to Ethiopia. Paul's about to go again to Uganda, Uganda on Monday. Many, many miles. And that's what Paul did here as far as this great journey was concerned. But what happened at the end of that? <coughs> he came back. You see, there was an association with the assembly. Not just from the today, but there was an association with Paul and Rachel right throughout their what and we know this, Paul will come back. We're looking for local work as well, Paul, not just in Uganda, not just in Ethiopia. We're looking for local work as well. Paul will come back and serve. You know, Paul will also come back. And he will tell not of the work which he has done. He will tell not of the work which Rachel has done. He will tell what? He will tell of the work which the Lord has done. Just let me, as I close today, just let me offer the hand of fellowship to Paul, <clears throat> the hand of fellowship to Rachel, and to Charlotte, and to Harry. God speak. God speak. Serve the Lord to the best of your ability. And I can just assure you that the fellowship of the saints here in the hall, there's the fellowship of the saints in many, many assemblies represented here today. We do trust again, that, and we do know the Lord will bless, the Lord will guide, and the Lord will. Thank you very much, uh, George. Now, before Ian comes and speaks to us, we'll all stretch our legs and uh, we'll sing uh, uh, him. By and by, when I look in his face, beautiful face from Shannon's face. And all the hymns this afternoon were chosen by <coughs> Paul, who we were angel, um, as well, and they do all contain that. Uh, challenge to service for each one of us so after the introduction again we'll rise and sing <laughs>
to, to be here. It's a great joy to see this wall so, so well filled. I'm sure the folks here in, in uh, Hill Hall are thrilled about that. And I'm sure Paul and Rachel are glad just to see so many friends uh, and family as well uh, gathered with them uh, on this occasion. I just want to read just a few verses then. Uh, the third epistle of John, third epistle of John, and we're just going to read the first four verses. John describes himself as the elder, and he then tells us who he's writing to. He says, uh, The elder unto the elder of Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Uh, and then he makes a request for the love. I wish above all things that we may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. You have often thought of that wee verse. <laughs> that we might prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. That our physical health would be commensurate with our spiritual health. I think if that was the case, if our physical health was a reflection of our spiritual health, I think there would be another layer added to the National Health Service. You know, we do so much to look after our bodies, but I wonder how much time we really spend looking after the needs of our soul. I wonder what our spiritual life is like this afternoon. You know, it is easy to come to meetings, isn't it? And it's easy just to go through all the routines of things. But you know, what about our hearts? What are we really like in the presence of God? What's our spiritual life like? And so Paul, as far as Gaius was concerned, gave tremendous confidence in Gaius. And he says that he desired that his health, his physical health, would be, uh, would be equal to his spiritual health. But then he says in verse 3, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. And then verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. That's my joy this afternoon. That is my joy. The joy that John expresses in this little epistle. No greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Now, John wasn't speaking about a, an actual child. Gaius wasn't a John's natural son. He was his spiritual son. <coughs> and you know, someone asked me recently, how many children and grandchildren do you have? And I said, well, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. And that's the thrill of being involved in the work of the Lord. And George has been reminding us we should all be involved in the work of the Lord. We're all called to be evangelists, to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus. And the great thrill is that we just don't know the effect of our service for the Lord. You know, I'm looking forward to being in heaven and seeing the Lord above all things. But, but just to see the unfolding of all that the Lord has done in my life and through my life. The wonder of that. You know, I, I keep coming back to this, that we are part of something big. We're part of something big. You know, it's so easy to become discouraged in these days in which we live. Now I know there's a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties and there's a lot of darkness out there in society, but we're part of something big. We're, something, we're part of something that is eternal. <laughs> Some of you remember those who are from Yellow Hall in the district that just a few weeks ago, Brother Alan Gamble stood at this very lectern and he asked the question before he started his message, what's the biggest thing that is happening in the world today? What's the biggest thing? It's not the Ukrainian war and all its implications. It's not the energy crisis. The biggest thing that's happening in the world today is the outworking of the purpose of God through the preaching of the gospel. That's the big thing. And this gathering this afternoon is part of that. It's part of that. This is something big. This is something divine. 
This is something eternal. This gathering is an evidence of the working of God. God working out his purpose through his people. That's a humbling thing. That's a humbling thing. No, we say, you know, this event is not a standalone event. You know, there's a backstory. There's a backstory. I don't have time, and I, I don't have the knowledge to, 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 to go through all of Paul and Rachel's backstory. How they came to this point. How God led them to this point. But you know, there's a story there. Story of Christian parents that loved them and cared for them and above all the people and desired heaven's best for them. Who can place a value in a mother's prayers? Who can place a value in a father's ambition, his spiritual ambition for his children? Forget about the world and all the world has to offer us. Christian father, Christian mother, I trust that your desires for your children are way beyond what the world can offer them and what they can get out of the world. I trust your desire is that your children may just be surrender utterly to the Lord. <coughs> Parents, Sunday school teachers, over the years, children's workers, children's campaigns that they sat and listened to and they heard the gospel. The sweet story of the Lord Jesus being poured into their ears and impressions being made by the Spirit of God. Who can value all that? It's part of the back story to this event this afternoon. Not just one thing that led to this. It's not just one person that brought the whole thing uh, uh, into being. It's a whole series of events, a whole series of spiritual happenings and spiritual work. God using various individuals to bring two youngsters to themselves. I suppose you know that all the time you think you know that when, when, when somebody speaks in the gospel and a, a sinner is saved, then it's the work of the preacher. And the preacher might just be just in the last year like in the chain, but there's maybe a hundred, there's maybe a thousand, there's maybe ten thousand likes before that. Mm -hmm. So you know what, I'm humbled this afternoon. I'm honoured to be here, but I'm humbled before God that the last year like in the chain took place in a gospel meeting in the hall in Newcomer when Paul was 13 years of age. You see, you must have preached well that night. Mm. <coughs> to be honest, I don't know whether I've ever preached well anyway. But it's not about the preaching. It's about the work of the Spirit of God. It's about God working in our soul. It's about the Spirit of God bringing a revelation of Christ. Mm. And after, that, after the meeting when the new come, you'll think of the exercise of the brothers there to arrange the meeting. Think of the young man who was in the, in the same room and his knees for the whole duration of the meeting. And the preacher just going to fade into the background in the light of all that. And God works. God works. I wonder if there's someone in the hall this afternoon and you've never yet come to know Paul, Savior, Rachel, Savior. You know them, but maybe you don't know him. <coughs> Maybe you don't know Christ. Or that you might have that revelation of the Spirit of God in your soul this afternoon. That your greatest need is Christ to be your Savior. The one that can set you free. The one that can give you a hope and a glorious future. You need Him. Or that you might find Him. Or that you might have that revelation of Him this afternoon. Think of all the events since then. Think of all the teaching you listened to. Think of all the, the advice from elders in Galston and other people that were, were feeding into his life, feeding into Rachel's life. And all the encouragement. You know, he's told me in the past about the text message. 
You know, sometimes the service of the Lord can be a lonely business. A lonely business. And there's many times when you think you've preached your heart out and, and there's hardly a response. <coughs> they talked about the wee text message. It just encouraged them. It just helps you to just go again and just go again. And text messages from people that are maybe more or less kind of unknown in the big scale of things. They're all part, all part of the story. All part of the story. Isn't that beautiful? You know, I woke up the other morning there with a kind of crazy thought in my mind. They're all important. But none of us is all important. We're all important. And none of us are all important. Some of us need to get a hold of the last bit. Maybe we all need to get a hold of the first bit. We're all important. We're all important. Everybody is needed. Nobody is needed more than anybody else. You know, the world's media has been focused for two weeks on the spear. Praise God, there's no spears in God's family. There's no spears in God's family. God's got a place and God's got a purpose and God's got a plan for every one of his children. And he just wants us to be exercised about fulfilling that. And so I'm really, as I say, I'm just humbled in honour just to, to share in this another little step in, in Paul and Rachel's journey. You know, at the end of the day, I was thinking that we're all just bit players. We're all just bit players. And there's only one big player. And that big player is God himself. We're all part of the story of God. We're all part of his story. I love to think about it. I just love to think of the vast eternal tapestry that he's weaving. And we're just a wee strand of a cloth somewhere, a wee strand of or maybe just a knot in the under the back side of it. I thought of the story, I thought of God's story. And maybe some of us are just a little punctuation part. Maybe some of us are a word, a sentence, maybe a paragraph. But you know, the punctuation mark in the story is just as important as the paragraph. We're all important in the outward. You know, it's great just to see God at work, isn't it? It's great to see God. The master. You know, we, we renovated our hall about 10 years ago or thereabouts, and there's one dear brother, he's sitting here, his name's John Leach, uh, and he, he, he was there, he was at that hall every day, and the builders were there. Maybe twice a day, just to see the men working. Just to be amazed and he'll say, you know, tell me, this is how Mark did this. And, and just amazing. Have you seen the brothers? Have you seen the, have you seen, have you seen the sons? You're know, just amazed. Just to watch our master craftsman. You know, you know, it's good to, even this Saturday afternoon, just to take a wee step back. And just marvel at the workings of the master craftsman. Marvel. <coughs> The workings of an eternal God. Brothers and sisters, I said this a few weeks ago when I spoke at the baptism of this uh, and Lucy down there and Christians. I think it's time we start getting excited about being a Christian. I think we'll watch the thrill of it all and the bigness of it all and the awesomeness of it all. And just to realise, of course, that. At the end of the day, it's not about us. It's all, it's all about it. It's all about it. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that the Lord has been touching our hearts about locally is the need to sing our songs and share our stories. Hey, that's what Israel did. You know, you get that right through it. 
you'll get it in the Psalms, but you'll get it right through the history of Israel. They sung the songs of deliverance and they stole the stories of redemption. They told of the workings of God. On a prayer meeting the other morning there in Zoom, and we were talking, and I said, You know, it's time we, we took our Christianity out of the classroom and took it out of the community. It's got to be more than thieves, it's got to be living, living our lives in the joy, the joy of the Lord. I've just got a few words of advice for Paul and Rachel. Words that were given to me many years ago. The first was this go slow, go slow. No, don't be driven in your life. But be led. Be led in your life. Don't be driven by your own ambition. Don't be driven by your own instincts and cities. Don't be driven by your desire to meet every need that is presented to you. Just allow yourself to be led by the gracious spirit of the Lord. You know, it's interesting when you read the Gospels that the Lord Jesus did you meet every need that he saw. Yeah. He never met every need that he saw. Sometimes we think we have, we have a kind of responsibility and we see a need and we see an opportunity and we think, well, that's for us and we dive right in. But the Lord Jesus was the right hand. He was sensitive. <coughs> he committed every day to his father and just saw the will of the father and the guidance of the father. Take advice from us. <coughs> but don't allow yourself to be controlled by it. You know, I've just got that kind of tendency, maybe among our kind of circle, that we think that we think that the full-time servants are, are owned <coughs> by the church that sent them forth. But you know, we need to we need to be sensitive that, that we only really have one master, and that's the one that saved us and the one that called us to follow him and we're answerable to him. So there's that need in our lives, in all of this, in Paul and Rachel's life, in all of this, just to develop intimacy with the Lord. You see, activity for the Lord, you know, that almost kind of comes naturally because we're, we're generally speaking, kind of active beings. We want to be doing. But you know, there's something far more important than activity for the Lord, and that is intimacy with the Lord. <laughs> And if our activity for the Lord doesn't spring forth from intimacy with the Lord, then it won't be too long till we'll be falling flat on our face. It's interesting that sometimes in the course of life, God calls us apart. He calls us apart before we come apart. Remember the Sabbath tells us, He knows our fame. He remembers that we're dust. And so when the Lord is calling you up, apart from all the activity and all the service and all the hustle and bustle, He tells you to come apart, come apart. Because if you don't come apart and rest in His presence, physically and spiritually, then you will come apart. I remember the late Robert McFeet saying to me one day, he says, I would judge you, and he says, there's three big things in your life. He says, there's like your family, and he says, there's the assembly, and he says, there's a lot. He said, how would you, how would you rate them? How would you put them in order? And I said, well, the Lord would be first. And then the assembly, and then your family. Oh, no, no, no. The Lord's got to be first. He says, but your family's got to be saved. The family's got to be saved. Well, I'm sad to say that I never always obeyed her. Oftentimes in my life, I forgot that. Don't sacrifice your children on the altar of service. God gives us a family and gives us responsibility for our family. And it's important to spend time for the family. So go slow. Keep low. Keep low. The need for humility. 
know, this isn't the end of the journey for uh, Paul and Rachel. It's, it's just really a, it's just really the end of a new phase of the journey. And you know the reality is that until we reach the end of the journey, it just works in process. There's plenty of lessons to learn. There'll be plenty of roads to, to, to travel and corners to turn and experiences to go through. We just need to keep humble and low. To remain teachable. I remember speaking to a missionary over the years ago and he said, you know, I went to the mission field to teach. And he said, I ended up in the I ended up in the That's a hard lesson, isn't it? You know, when you think you're sent forth as a missionary, then you, you have somebody. And you discover you'll be big lessons to learn in your own personal life. He said, I thought I was going there to do a work for God. And I discovered that God wanted to do a work in me. God wanted to do a work in me. You know, sometimes that's hard when God starts working in our life. Sometimes God brings us to a place of brokenness in order to bring us into a place of blessing. In order to bring us into a place of blessing. You know, when as a Christian, the best place to be and the safest place to be is just at the bottom of the cross. It's just at the bottom of the cross. Brother from America said to me a number of years ago, he says, Ian, he says, never, never lift your head. Never lift your head above the base of the cross. See, it's there at the cross we appreciate what we are. But it's there at the cross we appreciate the wonders of God's mercy, God's grace, God's love. All of nature are just bigger than the stuff. Just keep on at the cross of oh, Jesus. Go slow. Keep low. And don't go. Don't go. You see, there's big temptations when you're out in the work as we talk about big temptations. One of the big temptations is to be offered. And just to take a story to be amplified to make it sound a bit better for others. You know, in another part of the UK there used to be there used to be reporters for full-time servants and they used to call it a feast of You know, people trying to outdo each other as to, you know, how many souls they'd seen saved and, and all the rest of it. The work is there is all for them. Never to boast in anything apart from Christ and the cross. That's what Paul said. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus. I was touched just a couple of days ago. The lunch with Rachel and Paul, and Paul asked me, Harry, to get thanked. And his first words were, Jesus died on the cross. Mm. Isn't that not beautiful? You can see the size of it. I don't know why you can it, but you, know, you can see the size of it. Jesus died in the cross. I think he's really very happy. He's the happiest moment. Oh, keep taking us to the cross. Take us to the Every time you preach the gospel, take us to the cross. Every time you minister to the saints, just take us to the cross. Rachel said, we're trying to get him to say that we thank Jesus for dying on the cross, but praise God, there'll come a moment when he will say that. The very depths of his heart. As we pray not only for his mom and dad, but pray for Harry and his sister's child. But God's hand with it. That these youngsters will be busy <laughs> and when they come, they will come to find Jesus for dying on the cross. My time's nearly over. I was thinking this morning, I was 
thing of the transfiguration and I thought of the you know, the transfiguration was a big event in the experience of these three disciples. And then Peter responds. And he says, let us make. Let us make three power. Let us make. That's the flesh. <laughs> that's the flesh. And that's so often our response, isn't it? When we're faced with a situation, let us, let us, let us make, let us do, let us go. Lord just shrouded the whole scene of that. And as the cloud of darkness left him, they saw no man. They saw no man. Jesus on the Jesus on the man. Folks, that's who we need to see. That's who we need to gaze upon. That's who that's whose voice we need to listen to. That's who they must be filled. Our personal effectiveness for him is deeply related to our personal, personal enjoyment of him. Our personal effectiveness for Christ in the world is deeply related to our personal enjoyment. Keep Christ at the very centre of your home. Keep Christ at the very centre of your family. Keep Christ at the very centre of your ministry. I just want to leave a few verses from Isaiah. I know this is a bit strong, but these are the verses that the Lord gave me 30 odd years ago. And I spoke in these verses of my commendation. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. And I'm sure you've got a few fears because you've got the future. Because we like to be in control of our future. We like to be in control of everything in our lives. And the Lord takes us away. We get our comfort zone and we get anxious. Fear the Lord. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Even just to get hold of that the sun. And then he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. What promises, what glorious promises. He says in verse 5, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, get up and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. He promises to draw his people to himself. So when I say that, I remember, I remember a Saturday morning. The Hill House Farm, my brother Tom, and Sandy Brownlee and said to myself on her knees in prayer, praying, 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 praying for we were children. And you know that morning, that was the best of the world, yes. We would bring our children from the far. We would bring them back. We would bring them back. And one of the things we've been burdened about all the night over the last two weeks is the prodigals. The prodigals. Praying to God would bring the prodigals home. <laughs> and the meeting this afternoon. If you once sat in meetings like this and you enjoyed the things of the Lord and you've drifted away for one reason or another, the Father's heart was suffering. It's very simple. It's just that you make them go. You make them whole. He's calling the prodigals.
take part in the commendation meeting of Paul and Rachel. I've known Paul and Rachel and Paul's father and mother for a long time. I've also known Rachel's grandparents for her and her and her parents. And it's just wonderful to be here to see this hall so packed with the passage. It's also wonderful to be sharing the meeting with Ian. I can remember we spent many years together in the portable hall. I don't think, maybe apart from one meeting, we've, we've shared a, a, a conference together, and it's so nice to be with Ian today as well. I won't read the comment that the, the, the verses that was read by George on Acts 13. Some people have asked, well, what is a commendation meeting? Well, I've been at this evening and for three times, but this is the first time I've spoken at the commendation meeting about somebody else who's going out in the work of the Lord. There was a number of brethren in Antioch serving the Lord, including Barnabas and Saul. <coughs> Barnabas is mentioned first, and Saul is mentioned last. And from the first time that they were on the scene, Barnabas, who was a real servant of God, was 13 years before God said, in relation to these men, separate me, Paul, and Barnabas. <coughs> God was calling them to serve him. And of course, they were much in prayer in relation to the Seven God. It was 13 years when I was first called to serve God until it actually happened. And perhaps most of you remember that we were called initially to India. And 12 days before we left, for India, with all our stuff down in Southampton, the Indian government <coughs> telephoned us to say, we're sorry, the government has changed their plans and you cannot come to India. We were shattered. But you see, as we began to read the scriptures, we discovered from Acts 13 that these people who were called of God to serve him in a wider way than the others in Antioch. They weren't called to a place. <coughs> they were called to a work. And I remember when in these intervening months when God redirected us, I was spoken to by George Walk. And he said to me, the strength of God cannot be stemmed, they can only be diverted. And he mentioned the Apostle Paul. He wanted to go north, and the Spirit of God forbade him. He wanted to go south, and the same answer was from the Holy Spirit. And he was guided to go forward. And if he hadn't been guided by the Lord, we might never have had Paul and Europe, but thank God he was guided by the Holy Spirit in his service. For those of us in Ayrshire, as we watched our brother and sister Paul and Rachel, it was very evident that God was guiding them to commence in full-time service for the Lord. Paul was involved, has been involved in his interest in Uganda for over 10 years, seeking to have the small work in and around in the capital. Paul was also keen to display the word of God in these large texts that are up in UK, 
Uganda, Congo, Canada, and we hope soon in Ethiopia. Paul was also involved in reaching people by displaying his gospel van at important gatherings. Paul was involved in gospel driving meetings at the cattle market. Paul has been involved in a series of meetings in Canada twice, in Simonton, and recently he and I shared meetings in Moscow. Notice that there was not only no mention of the kind of work they were involved in, it says just to the work. They were told to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Paul recalled he appointed to be a preacher and a teacher of the word of God. But he awaited God's timing for his life. He would, was content to abide in Caesarea, in Tarsus, and then before learning of the divine exercise. There's a big burden on the part not only of the two men who were going to serve God, but also a deep burden and concern by the assembly who were going to commence them. both in prayer and in a practical way. As we look at the reference of the laying on of hands, it was evident that they were going to support this couple moving out to serve God in a prayerful and in a practic practical way. I've often been totally amazed as to how God exercises people in supporting just at the right time. I remember going to a funeral some years ago, and I sat down just beside an old sister, and before the meeting commenced for the, 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 the burial service, she looked over to me and she said, I pray for you every day. I was touched at that. I have never met her before. I have never met her since. And yet, here was a dear woman who laid aside this burden in her heart to pray for us. I remember Willie Morrison, who originally was living in Ayr, <coughs> and he moved across the fog because of the work. And I met him at a conference some years afterwards and he said to me, I pray for seven couples from Ayrshire every day, and you and Sheena are one of them. I thought that was marvellous. Here was someone who was a long distance away from me, and yet he had this great burden <coughs> to pray for him, to pray for us. I do hope that there are folks here this afternoon, and you're going to lay the hearts of Paul and Rachel in your, in your heart, and you're going to pray for them daily. I do hope you have a prayer list and a prayer time when you lay God's servants to heart. I remember. Uh, when I was thinking about this this afternoon, there are booklets available that you can get information about evangelists and full-time workers and missionaries. I first of all, I get the daily prayer guide for, for, for my efforts of international. I use this every day. And it gives me information as to what the servants of God are doing. I commissioned it from Bath and it arrived this afternoon. And there's also a magazine which they also are available. And if anybody wants to commence using these two magazines, Jim Armstrong said, 
they can get the first 12 copies free. That's ideal for the Scots. <laughs> and if you can have become so involved in this, then you can continue for the rest of your life. I've used this ever since we went to Ethiopia. That's 55 years ago. There is a, a, a new look in the fields. Uh, they've made a wonderful job of it in this, in this last month. I was speaking to the brother who was involved in it, and he said, if you want one of these look in the fields, then just contact the office, Lord's Work Trust, and you'll get a copy of it free of charge. That's even better. <laughs> You'll find out, you'll get to know all of the, the, the maps and, and you'll get to know all of the people who are there and all the different things. And there's even uh, <coughs> out in the work and what they're doing worthwhile. I use that every day. I think I've got about 12 little booklets that I use every day <coughs> regularly. They're telling do you have a prayer list of people that you will want to be praying regularly? I remember folks were saying, as you leave the hall door, I'll pray for you. And they pray maybe for the next first two or three days, maybe the first week, maybe two or three weeks, maybe a month, and then of course they forget them. And they're completely out of their mind. But if you have a little prayer list, which I have, individual people that I pray for every day, then that's so important. I remember when Malcolm Radcliffe went out in full tape service, having helped me in the portable hall for a number of times. <laughs> At that meeting, there was a couple and they were in the audience whose burden was confirmed to serve the Lord in a full-time way. That couple is John and Anne Grant. And look what has been produced as a result of that, and they give God thanks. My mother said to me, the day before she died, your father and I prayed that God would send one of our children to the mission field. I was deeply burdened because of what she said. Because she never saw her sister only a very few times because they were serving in Brazil for over 60 years. She never saw her brother for the same reason serving God in Brazil for over 50, 60 years. When Paul was converted, the first question he had in his mind was, Lord, what will they have me to do? During the last three months, it has been thrilling to see the many young people who have been baptized. And that is a real thrill to my heart. And to see so many here this afternoon, that is, a, is even a greater thrill. Paul Philip wondered when he came across the Ethiopian dinner. And he was, wasn't too sure how he felt about the Ethiopian dinner and the Lord Jesus as to what, who he thought he was. And when he was asked the question, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Ethiopian eunuch went back into Ethiopia, and to this day, the result of that conversation and conversion has had an effect in Ethiopia for 2,000 years. And today, Ethiopia is called a nation of Christianity in a sea of Islam. I believe that God has a plan 
for all of our lives. And it should be our burden and desire to ask God what he wants us to do with our lives. Perhaps God wants you to serve him in your assembly so that you can support and help those who are seeking to serve him in a full-time way. But he wants us all to be burdened to what God is wanting in our lives. Serving God presents many extra problems in relation to service. I remember when Sheena and I first met, she wasn't wrong, I think the second night out, when she told me, I'm not sure about our relationship. I said, why? She said, God has called me to this hospital because he wants me to be a missionary nurse. And I said, that's exactly why I'm here. But then she said, but he might be calling you to one country and maybe calling me to another country. So just get two pieces of paper and you write them down where God has called you to. And I'll be the same. By this time my, my legs were shaking. But when you change the pieces of paper on the, on the papers, both had just one word, India. And she said then, I believe that God has brought us together. But of course, there were things in difficult times when we went to Ethiopia, we lived in a mud house. No warm running water but in the river. No electricity, just an oil lamp. I can still see her writing letters to her mother every, every week. It's a real challenge. And then, and just as Ian was saying, I remember being, before we went to Ethiopia, I was serving God in a variety of ways in the east of Scotland. But when I went to Ethiopia, I could do nothing. Because I didn't know the language. We learned the grammar in the first year, and then Ethiopia and Haric in 10 years. Not an easy task. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, we find a section which I call Passing the Baton. At our school, I was a good runner. And the teacher was training us about the relay race. And he said to us, Don't start to run too early. He has just mentioned that. Don't start until it's too early. If you start running early, you may run out of the area where you can transfer the battery. But then he said, don't wait till it's too late to run. <coughs> I have known of people in God's, in God's work. He felt the call of God to serve him in his particular way, but they've never fulfilled that desire. I remember how it said said about serving the Lord of God, and he replied by saying, God has called me to serve him at home so that I can support the work of God in Botswana. Bobby Allison was a great leader from Bolson who was called to serve God in Africa, initially in Angola, then Rhodesia, and to other parts of, of Africa, including Botswana. He said that if a person feels deeply exercised about God's work for them, there should be, first of all, a planting by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> a conviction deep in the heart that that is what God is wanting you to do. And that's so oftentimes difficult to follow in, in, in everyone's experience. But secondly, he says, not only a conviction that God has planted through the Holy Spirit <coughs> of serving God, but a continuance 
of this deep exercise that you're in the mind and will of God. Perhaps there is someone here in this hall this afternoon and God is really been challenging you as to what you can do for him. Keep just seeking God's help and guidance that he will guide you to the place of his appointing. I remember when we stepped out in faith 55 years ago. The first year was the most difficult year that we ever had experienced in our lives. I recall one afternoon, a tele I received a telephone message. And this man said, I'm a Mr. Robinson, and I work for the United Nations. And I just went down to the echoes of Jefferson and asked him, is there anybody serving God in Ethiopia? And they said, yes, there's a Mr. and Mrs. Reedy in the capital. Our children had gone to a boarding school and the, the, the fees were just, uh, just ready to be paid. So we did not have the money. And we asked God that morning, Lord, you'll have to provide the money. Can you imagine the situation? I said to this brother, actually I have a service this evening about half past six for nurses in one of the hospitals. But after that I'll come and pick you up and take you to the house and then you can have some a time of, a fit of a fellowship and then I can take you back to your hotel. He said that would be very nice. So we did that. Mr. Robertson appeared, uh, uh, came, we discovered after he came to the house that he was the chairman of CMML in America. And there was a lot of time together. And it, I took him back to the hotel. And just as, as I left him, he slipped a piece of paper in my, in my top pocket. I had a clue what it was when I got home. And we opened it. It was the exact money for the school's fees. What a wonderful God we had. And before you call, I will answer. And there should be, thirdly, a commendation by the Holy Spirit and a commendation by the assembly. We're just a help of it, Mr. Gooding. Well, he married us and he did a good job. <laughs> and, and we read that, we sang that hymn by and by. And so often I've heard Jack Hunter say, When you say that, it'll be too late. Do it today. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your service. You're serving the best of masters. It's a tremendous thrill to see what God is doing in your life. Paul knows Ginchy. And we were at Ginchy just last year. And as I preached in Ginchy with about 400 to 500 people, just as I finished my message, I could see a, a, a young woman standing up and walking down towards the platform. And one of the elders noticed it as well. And he just took her into a side room. She wanted to trust the Savior. And it's a thrill when you see that happening. And God moves in power. And there's a wonderful day coming when we'll be in His presence and we'll know what it is to serve God faithfully. It has been emphasized so importantly that Rachel is involved as much as Paul is. I remember she was saying, <coughs> when I was in the mission field, I never saw my children. And when I came home to the UK during the funeral, I never saw my husband. And that was true. 
There are sacrifices to be made in the service. But my, we have a wonderful Savior. We have a wonderful message. And we just pray that we might see God moving in mighty power in this area, in Ayrshire, and maybe other meetings that are happening in the near future. Wonderful to see God moving in a mighty way. But don't leave it until it's too late. And as we think of that, Rachel, of course, has got the responsibility as well. And of course, Paul will be away sometimes, and it's just so important to recognize that we should be bringing to them in prayer as they seek to serve God at this particular time. And I trust that out of this afternoon, there might be those who will serve God in a full-time way in the near future. May God bless his word to your heart.
pressure that Paul is under is that the pie is ready at 5 o'clock. So, I have to finish for then. There is food available at the end of the meeting, and Paul, of course, uh, and Paul can stay behind and fellowship uh, with us and with Paul and Rachel at the end. So, that's good. Uganda for today. <laughs> I'm not sure there'd be too many people that happy about that. But it, um, David, uh, David just wasn't that accurate there. I'm, I'm, not been, I'm not been looking forward to uh, standing up here. Quite ironic when you spend quite a lot of time on the platform yet. You don't really want to get up on the platform. What do we do trust? that as we look at the scriptures together and what we say and what we will share, that God will be uh, blessed uh, as we come together. I'd just like to turn uh, to the Word of God for a, a, a brief time and just read two verses that has been um, on our mind and influential in the <coughs> decision that we have uh, come to. We're both found in the book of the Psalms. And the first one is in Psalm 18. Psalm 18. And verse 30. Someone said to me yesterday, you would never have thought you'd get nervous on the platform. Well, just to give you an idea, I'm on my third heartburn tablet so far. I've got a fourth in my pocket. And then... Um, I remember speaking to Blair Martin one time before we were speaking together and I said to him, Blair, we still get nervous. And I remember exactly what he said. He says, Paul, my hair is beating out of my chest. <laughs> and I can, uh, can certainly sympathise with that today. Psalm 18 and verse 30. It says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is time. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And Psalm 27 and 14. Psalm 27 and 14. It says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord, and with the trust that God will land a blessing. You know, Rachel and I have been looking at this and talking about it. We have find personal enjoyment by recounting the, the little things, but the very significant things that has happened over many years in our life. Some of the things, there will be very few in this room that will have heard about them. Uh, Maybe only family will have heard little snippets of some of them, but it's what we have been holding very dear to, and we do trust that you will be encouraged, and that it will be a challenge to some here today. You know, I've, I've been dreading this week. I really have. And uh, I've been dreading it for several reasons. But one of them was, Rachel and I were sitting a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the meeting. I said, Sweet, we don't know that many people. And Elon holds an off a big hall. I said, I'm not sure we could fill a phone box. But as we look out here today, I'm so humble. And it's so encouraging. To see so many. And the truth is, I have to be honest, I don't actually know everyone here. I know the most. I was standing at the door and I saw a few folk come in. And I don't know your person. But we thank you so much for coming. And we do, as Robert has mentioned, we want to reiterate, and Ian has mentioned, that we can't put into words how much we have appreciated over the last seven years. Those that have prayed daily. And those that haven't just given, but those that have sacrificially given to us as a family. And I want to publicly say we greatly value that, we greatly appreciate that. Your love and your care that has been shown 
towards us. This, this is going to be a bit reminiscent of a wedding day, or far wedding day, but don't, don't cheer. On behalf of my wife and I, thank you for coming. It really means the world to see you here. You know, I, I appreciate that many has come, maybe some has come out of curiosity to see what was on at a commendation meeting. I was a wee bit curious, to do not you? But the majority are here to, or all are here to show their support towards us. But it's our desire, it's our deep desire, and Ian has already read this verse, and it's a verse that's very precious to me. In Matthew 17, and verse 8, it's, it's our little family's desire that everyone would leave here. Fill me one in a night. That they would see no man. Save Jesus only. He's the only one worth looking at. He's the only one worth thinking about. He's the only one worth living for. He's the only one worth serving. And it's at this point I want to look out and go to I want to ask you very simply a question. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you personally, individually know Christ as your own? Have you claimed him as your own? I don't know where everyone stands spiritually, but I need you to know. Rachel and I need you to know that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He's very precious to us. And it's because of how precious he is we have taken this step uh, out of love and service of Christ the Savior. You know, the Bible says very clearly that Christ died for our sin. Ian was the mouthpiece the night that God saved my soul. And he pointed me to the Savior. And for the first time I realized. I was a sinner on the road to hell and he desperately needed a savior to save me. And he pointed me to the center cross. And it was upon that cross, 2,000 years ago, I acknowledged that Christ died for me. But what about you? Friends and family, those that I've worked with, neighbors are here to do. Do you know Christ is your savior? You know, this is meant, I've been told this is meant to be a really enjoyable day, a very happy occasion, and maybe after. There, there was a wee bit of truth with, with what David was saying. I probably would have liked to wait first just to get over that one. But you know, it is, it is lovely to see everyone here, and there, there is happiness involved in today. But you know what would make it a little bit happy? To know that someone accepted Christ as their own personal Savior today. It thrill our heart. Do you know what I love above that? I love that all heaven rejoices when one soul gets saved. I wonder will that be you? Now, just for a little while, I'm still the sauce of rolls and the pies are the pies are on for five. And, and, uh, someone in the front row told me to get a shimmy on. <coughs> should maybe do that. But just for a little while, we would like to share what the Lord has been doing and how he has been directing us to take this decision and to step out in faith and serve the Lord full time. You know, if you've come here today expecting a very extravagant um, commendation meeting with bright lights and trumpets and uh, real ex extraordinary experiences, probably going to go home disappointed. But what we do have and what we do hold very dear to is over many years God working in our lives, God preparing and paving the way for us to take this step. You know, truthfully I can look back over 20 years to when I can first remember God personally challenging me to serve the Lord. And actually the person that was used that day is in the audience and his name's Moses Oluka. He's from Uganda, he was born, brought up in Uganda and he came to study, believe it was food science in Scotland and 
we met Moses and to cut a long story short, he came and lived in our house for a period of time and I think I can truthfully say he just became part of our family. And Moses, I can remember the exact spot, exact spot where we say that you believed that one day you and I would preach together in Uganda. I was 13. I thought Moses, Moses was not. <laughs> I thought he was absolutely mad. I'd never been to Africa. Actually, the truth is, I couldn't tell you where Uganda was in the map. Funny enough, I still, when I'm flying to different places, I still have to Google where they are, but that's going to be not getting any better. I thought Moses was mad. Moses, the truth is, I'd never told you that. And I maybe hid it quite well that day, but 10 years later, in November 2013, Moses and I shared the gospel for the first time in Uganda. As for God, the psalmist says, His way is perfect. And this is the pattern that Rachel and I have seen over many, many years. And as a young boy, he has rightly said, I was brought up, my family, where Christians, they love the gospel. <coughs> I can say that with all my heart. And really deeply loved and loved the gospel. And I remember often being bailed into a Volvo estate. I'm pretty sure when the sold I went to Ukraine to go into the front lines, because that's sturdy. And I remember going to different gospel meetings. Actually, the night that I got saved at New Covenant, I'll never forget it. And I, I know I probably get into trouble for saying this because. Mum doesn't like to be rejected at all, but if you're a mother, I want to encourage you the value of your role in your children's life. Because the night that I got saved, it was our own local prayer and Bible study. And Mum not willing to let another opportunity slip back. She suggested that Dad would go locally to the meeting and Mum would take me to the gospel meeting. That was that name. I can see it. You see, there's, there's great value in being a mother. Eternal value in being a mother. And truthfully, I, I love the gospel. I remember traveling with Dad as he did, went to different uh, assemblies to preach the gospel. I remember sitting, watching Dad preach the gospel. I remember hearing other men, men that I have now had the privilege to serve my apprenticeship under preach the gospel to. Never once, and I can honestly say this with God as my witness, never once in my young years did I think there would be ever a possibility that I would preach the gospel. Never did I think I would stand in front of a hat call and be able to speak. Because it was, it was a big problem in my life. I had a problem that quite literally would render a preacher speechless. All through primary and secondary school, I had really bad stuff. I, I know not many here will believe that. But it, was, it was dreadful. Funny enough, my family never once made fun of me. Never once. But they did say this, it all started to disappear when we got into an argument. <laughs> I thought the only way forward for me was to go into politics. <laughs> I had a bad, bad stutter, actually so bad that I couldn't give English oral um, talks at school. Almost failed English because of it. And I remember travelling the length and breadth of the UK. I even remember going to Ireland to visit a speech therapist. And none of them worked. I still remember what they told me. You just need to breathe. I remember looking at them saying, well, you're breathing pretty good so far. <laughs> I'm doing a good job of the breathing. And time after time, I went to speech therapist and nothing helped or fixed this problem. I remember leaving school and starting work in the family business. And I remember being terrified of this small white machine in the office called the telephone. I remember looking at it and it genuinely 
scared the living daylights out of me. So I would have to maybe, if that arrived, I, should, I would have to do what normal people do and pick it up and answer it. And I remember facing my fears countless times and hearing the phone ring and my heart would race and I would look at it and I was now or never and I'd pick it up and sometimes I would get a booty chaser. Other times I would be ringing the streets. Now, maybe going to be getting in trouble a couple of times because there's someone that I'll never forget during that time. And no matter where he was or who he was speaking to, I remember he came, my brother Neil, he came running and he would just lift the phone and he would just take the phone off when he would carry on the conversation. 99.9% .9 of the time I think no one on the other end of the line was any of the wiser what had happened. The sound quite alike, the look sometimes quite alike too. And so, never once did he ever make a comment to me. But he would just act, I can still see him coming running. That is quite a <coughs> coming running through the office door and grabbing the phone and carrying on the conversation. He never once said anything to me. During this time, during my mid teen <coughs> to late teen era, I remember something, something that I could never get to get right was happening. I felt that God wanted me to preach the gospel. I couldn't understand it. And I remember, I, I and mean, anything I say here, I need you to understand, I say it with the utmost respect to who I'm speaking about. But I remember literally saying to God, I can't even say my name, never mind preach the gospel. How do you expect someone like me to stand in front of people when I can't even stand in front of my family and talk to them? I have to preach. I remember genuinely remember laughing. Laughing at the thought of me going to preach it. Of me standing in front of people and telling them the message. I loved the message, but I wasn't the man for the message. And then I came across this passage in Exodus chapter 4. Moses. In verse 10 it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither hereto it for, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? I remember reading that. I remember clutching this verse with all my heart. And I, I very vividly remember getting down on my knees and praying to the Lord. And I said to the Lord, if you would remove my stutter, I promise I'll preach the gospel. Now I know many here are quite skeptical of this kind of thing, and I appreciate that. And I've never really advertised or broadcast this at all. But my star was removed. And if I, if I can say this carefully, I believe. I believe I'm blind to the duty of serving God in the gospel. Because he held true to what he said. And I now must hold true to what I say to him. And I've not forgotten it. Sometimes I wish I could. Because it, I, I don't know, I, it certainly doesn't get any easier for me the older I get stand up to it. Actually, I think the heart gets, the heart gets an awful pound when you get the platform. But that's what happened to me during that period of time. And I, this is what God said to Moses. Moses, I therefore go. And I will be thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Brothers and sisters, is it possible that we lose sight of the great God that we have? The mighty, powerful, magnificent God in whom we have trusted. The question is asked in Genesis 18 and verse 14, is there anything too hard 
for the Lord. Well, Jeremiah, he gives the answer, doesn't he? In Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, when he says, Ah, Lord God, I behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Something very precious is the intimate interest that he has in each of our lives. And I believe wholeheartedly that he removed my stuff. Now, let's fast forward and conscious of the okay, well, minutes before I think I might get dragged down. The ties are good. But let's fast forward to when all the Christmases came at once. For Rachel. And she made me. Is that expression fat and above your, your leaf? Well, set my flies to me when Rachel and I met. But I can honestly, I can hardly believe it's 12 and a half years since we've been married. Now, if that doesn't make you feel old, I don't know what that I remember it as clear as day. 12 and a half years. And I can honestly say before you all, they've been the best, but also the hardest. Because it was during this time, it was during the last 12 and a half or so years, that these two verses that we have read would really put us to the test with these verses. As for God, His way is perfect. Well, I have to admit, we question that. And on more than one occasion, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, we struggle with the waiting game, too. It's difficult to wait. You know, not really anybody here, I would think, know this, you maybe came to your own conclusions why, but you probably have never heard it from the horse's mouth. So I'll say it today that Rachel and I were married for seven years before we had children, and it wasn't out of personal choice. You know, that wasn't our plan, that wasn't our idea. And the Lord had a plan that Rachel and I, we could never get a head We could not understand. We couldn't get our head around it. Why we weren't able to have children for so long. For around five long years. This grew from a, a desire to a burning, all-consuming fire in our lives. To the point all we wanted was a well kept. All we wanted was a rolling. And God had a different plan. And we really struggled with that for a long time. You know, I, I even remember family gatherings were difficult because we were the only ones without kids. And we would look at the kids and, and we just wanted a little kid. Well, our hearts would sink when occasionally I would be away preaching and Rachel would come with me and someone with the best intentions would say to you, I think he's not going to have kids soon. If you've ever said that to someone, don't say it again. It's not helpful. And you don't know what's going on in someone's life. I don't mean to be nasty when I say that. But you don't know what's going on. So please don't say it. And our hearts and the way we would sing, thinking that he had no idea how best to be one kid. Well, at this point, Rachel and I were involved in an outreach in Goldston. There's some from Goldston here. It's a place that still is very close to our heart. And we had an outreach that was primarily focused on those that were struggling, and those that were struggling with addiction. And occasionally we would meet folks who would come to us, we grew to love them. And occasionally we would meet folks and they would tell us that oh, we're pregnant. Well, did you hear we're pregnant? And their lives were nothing short of chaos. And we just couldn't understand it. We genuinely couldn't. We couldn't wrap our heads around it. And we would go home and we would say to the Lord, we promise that we'll love. We'll protect. We promise we'll provide. 
and raise this child up to love the Lord. Still nothing happened. And it was a long, long five years. Occasionally, to the very select few that didn't know what was going on in our lives, they would say this to us. And I, you look back in a day to come and you'll see God's hand in it all. Nothing more annoying than to be told that. <laughs> at that time, it wasn't at all helpful. But now, truly, truthfully, we can say, as we look back, we can see God's hand every step of the way. You see, just at the point that Rachel and I had truthfully almost given up hope, we found out that Rachel was pregnant with Charlotte, and soon after, uh, Harry came along and they have brought so much joy, anger, happiness to our lives. It's just been truly wonderful. Not long after we broke the news that Rachel was pregnant with Charlotte, I was booked to visit Uganda and when I was there I was handed this hand-painted Bible verse. And it said, 1 Samuel 1, verse 27. For this child, we pray. And the Lord has given me my petition, which I have of him. As we look back over those seven years, we truly can see God's hand at work in every step of the way. Did it take the pain away? Did it make it any less difficult? But those seven years that we had together, we travelled together, we worked together, we served together, we grew together. The very precious, valuable years that Rachel and I spent together. As for God, His way is perfect. Wait. It wasn't easy waiting. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well now, two minutes, it's a little well. Almost seven years ago, uh, seven years ago in May, we took the decision to reduce my hours uh, down to two days a week. And um, it wasn't an easy decision, nor was it an easy decision for the business, those in the business. It's a family business, as you know, mum and dad and my brothers. And it was a decision that they were 100% behind. They supported every step of the way. And as a result, they all worked harder because I wasn't there. And it was something that I'd seen. And greatly appreciated that they were willing uh, to do that to allow us to serve the Lord and to serve with men like Robert Reavy, Ian Roberts, and Jack Kay, and other men, Dolan Pickman. And just to serve my apprenticeship, to, to, to learn, to shadow these men have a lifetime of experience, and it was invaluable years, precious <coughs> years that I look fondly back. And it's a privilege to share with Ian and Robert today, two men, aside from my father that has been so influential in shaping and helping me, me and Rachel and I be who we are today. So if you want to believe anyone, there's your two or three men. But, you know, this decision did give us the perfect opportunity to just quietly learn, grow and serve the Lord. Through that time, it's many here and many further afield offered the right hand of fellowship towards us, and we will never, ever forget it. I was thinking as well, we, the, the week I went part time, it was the same week we took out the first billboard on the M77. I remember Ryan and Rachel went after I left the farm. Shaking the man's hand for a year's rent. I remember ringing Rachel on the phone, was like, my hand was like this. I says, Rachel, I've done it. We've signed it. We've signed it. He's, he, he's agreed to it. 
we're, we're renting it for a year. I says I'm terrified to do it, we're going to get the money for And I can, I can say this now, we never talk about needs that are outstanding, we always talk about needs that are met, because God needs a need. But every year since, and the work that we have been involved in has grew at an alarming, wonderful rate. And it's because God has provided in a wonderful way. And many here has been directed to support the work of Hope on the Roadside over many years and greatly appreciate it. But that same week, I remember ringing my dad and I said, Dad, would, would you come with me to Riches? I'd like to buy a Bible. I had a Bible, but I wanted to buy a preaching Bible. I one of the big ones. <laughs> the letter smelled nice, <laughs> soft to the touch. So Dad, Dad came along with me. I knew that I, I didn't know a good Bible or a bad letter bound Bible. Dad did. So and we were walking around Ritchie's and we were looking at different Bibles. Mm -hmm. I hope it wouldn't get the person in trouble because we've done them out of a sale. But that day. As Dad and I were wandering about, Willie Houston came down from upstairs and he was chatting to us and as he was about to part ways, he said, well, he's in for something in particular. And I says, Willie, I'm in for a Bible. I'm in for a big one. Preacher one. A nice quality one. So Willie disappeared and about five minutes later he came down with a Newbury box and a lovely Bible in his hand. And he said, I've got a few of these, Paul, and I've got one left, and I've been wondering who to give it to. And I'd like to give it to you. It's still the big preacher Bible I use today. Now, little did Rachel and I know that a few years later, Willie would be one of our elders, one of our commending elders, to even show in a simple way such kindness eh, towards us, support towards us. As for God, his way is perfect. Ian and Mary, I couldn't but not mention how kind with her time, generous with her time, sacrificial with her time, they have devoted to helping Rachel and I along our journey. It's been remarkable. When we needed someone, obviously our family was there, but Ian was always there and Mary always let him come over. He was always very willing to come to us and, and spend time with us, read with us. Went to the tabernacle, we one of our first studies together for years. And likewise it was a privilege on many occasions to share with Ian in the gospel. Now just to bring up today, anyone for Neil and Hall knows I'm normally late, so therefore I expect that I'm on the but I'm sorry if you're not physically late. But just to bring up to date and with this, I do promise to finish. There was one thing that always held us back. We were confident that God wanted us to be involved in the service of the Lord. But we didn't have a bright lights experience. We didn't have that big extravagant moment. And many of you probably know the kind of extravagant moment I'm talking about. You'll sometimes go to a report meeting, and I'm not saying for a second or not true. But sometimes they're not that helpful. Because Rachel and I would be at a, a report meeting or would be listening to a Tobolton missionary conference for years that had some such faithful men to come and, and share their call. And quite often Rachel and I would go away with a tail between our legs. Depressed. Things are nice. Those people had it all mapped out. Right? I had a big extravagant, extraordinary experience that was undeniable. And everyone in the audience was, was flabbergasted by what happened to them. And we didn't have that. But that truthfully really held us back. Can I say to anyone here today, you don't need more than a call of God. If he's calling you, be obedient to what he says. Because we really struggled with this for quite a number of years. Until we came across Acts chapter 9. We've read it many times before, but, but this day was different because Andrew Shanks, a very dear friend of ours, 
he sent me this same passage the same day that, that I was looking at. And it's about Saul or Paul. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told of thee what thou must do. You see, we, and I'm no different, we all as humans like to have the path very clearly laid out before us. We like to know what we're doing, where we're going, and what we're going to be saying, who we're going to be meeting. But Saul wasn't told any of that. Saul was just told to go. And then, I'll tell you what we'll do. And it was that experience that really confirmed to Rachel and I that God's looking for our availability. God wants our willingness. And the one thing that we have experienced time and time again is that He will not fail. He will not let us down. And sometimes He's never disappointed. So we then decided that if we would take a step and go, that He will then tell us what we will be doing. He will then tell us where we will be going. He will then tell us who, will be, who we will be meeting. And we hope he'll be telling us what he will be saying. <coughs> but that's really, that's really, Rachel and I, the future is going to not really change that much. It's going to be quite similar to what we have been doing. Um, we've been serving the Lord in some capacity for seven years. This has given us more time uh, to get more involved, not only really locally, but to assist Robert in Ethiopia, to assist in Uganda, and to really go where the Lord would have us go. We trust that we'll be obedient, and we will do, and we will go wherever, and do whatever he asks us to do. This is, I'll finish with this. We've received, he mentioned the text messages, very valuable, you know, sometimes people think that preachers know they're good or know that they've got one well and this, that, and the other thing. Most likely, if you go to the nearest McDonald's after a gospel meeting, you'll find the picture there. He's driving his sorrows in a big man. <laughs> so don't, don't, ever, don't ever lose sight of sending a wee text of encouragement to someone. I know one of the people on the platform knows that are out serving in the community. Don't think they already know that they're doing something for the Lord. Just encourage them. It's very, very valuable. One of the text messages that stood out was from someone that's here and someone that's not had an easy a time of it recently. This is what the message said at the end. Paul, I can confirm he is the best of pastors. And that there is no higher calling than to serve the Lord. To be a king among men would be a step down from being a servant of the most high God. As for God, his way is perfect. Wait in the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart, wait, I say, in the Lord. I do trust, as I finally close the Bible, I do trust that we will continue to pray for our little family. And we cannot express how much these prayers and your support means. And may God bless all that has come today.
box in at the back. And this food is served now, it's served uh, where it's sitting. And after any closes in there, gives thanks for the food, the food will be uh, served. <coughs> I would be very nice to this incident. Thank you, very much. I'm very very happy to be here. I hope to be here. We the second prize of the World Team in Calvary. We will find the idea for the World Team of salvation of we do as a result of the day and We do, I think we are to the building this afternoon to be a chef and not stay. We do ask you to speak to them. We do pray that some night in the building, even today, and that they'll like to the Savior and they'll even have no salvation from them. We do manage to get ahead of the challenge of thy word. We do ask you to help each one of us in the room this afternoon to, to ask the question more what we are having meeting with. And Father, we do, we do remember that each one of us have a obligation and commitments to tell me and we acknowledge the nice guidance of our father we can do so much better and we spend our time on rubbish and things that don't really matter we do ask you to help us of our increase our commitment and our devotion to the days of our health just before we have something to be commended to all and Rachel and I and Shabbat into thy care, bless them and I keep them, and may thy face shine upon them, guide them and help them, <laughs> and be with them in all that we seek to do in life. We, we, we love them and we ask you to bless them and help them and guide them and their service. So we commend ourselves to the thank you again for all I do this to us in so many ways for the temporal blessing we receive. Thank you for this food and another token of thy goodness to it. And above all, we get thanks for the gift of James, the gift of thy well beloved son. We get thanks for him.